Welcome back to the Scumbag Podcast. Season 2 is, of course, Ruminations on Online. And we have got Peter Stormare today. How are you doing, Peter? How are you? Uh, a little gloomy down in Los Angeles. We have clouds and rain today, which uh, makes me a little gloomy. <laughs> what about you? I'm the same way I'm sitting under one of those those giant lizard lights that they use for people with SAD. And it's not working at all, but <laughs> it's not even a circus. Not even psychosomatic, really, which is just sad, really. But you're probably one of the most honest celebrities on online as far as just, I'd call it maybe weird presence. that You just kind of do whatever you want, where others do either the very, it's, they'll do the more, oh, a mediated way. Kind of like I was talking to Vincent D'Onofrio about, it's very, they're either very mediated or very honest, but you're somewhere in the middle where you just post things you see and random videos. And is there a reason you do that or you just enjoy uh, doing what you want? <laughs> yeah, I am from a very simple background and I have no skills when it comes to social media and I just want to spread light and humor and laughter and I would like to spread some good music now and then to people instead of just bitching about the politics and bitching about stuff and being angry. Most people on Twitter are very angry and I, I, I don't know how to use Instagram or Facebook. There are some other people pretending to be me and they do an excellent job. But I'm, a, I'm, I do tweet now and then because it's part of my job. They, they nearly have it in a contract to promote a show or a movie over the tweet. And but I like to post strange things I see in life, and I've seen a lot of strange things. If I can take a snap and post it on my Twitter, I do it. So wait, so you just get, you find the weirdest stuff and post it then? Because I remember you gave me that Hello Kitty case, which I still have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm a big fan of Hello Kitty, and if I find a, a really good telephone case, I post it. And or uh, very strange citrus I find in my backyard. I post them because they're very rare. Wait, so you, do you grow <laughs> stuff in your backyard? Yeah, I got a lot of stuff in my backyard. There's no weed in my backyard. Right. There's no weed. <laughs> no weed. No weed. Yeah, no. Stay off the grass, man. I'm I'm from Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> Oxford, <laughs> the Oxford campus. Stay off the grass. But uh, no, I, I got a lot of citrus fruit, uh, which I love because I eat them straight. You know, like a, I clean, I clean the lemon, but I eat it with the peel and everything. It's very healthy for you. But I get these aliens, alien citrus in the back, and they're very cool to look at, and they communicate with you. I have something to fall back on if acting doesn't doesn't keep going. The economy goes now. You got your citrus to handle. Yeah, and I'm, you know, it's going to come on Netflix pretty soon. The citrus aliens in the storm in the backyard. Well, something I wanted to ask you about as well was we've talked about it offline, but one of the last things that I see from Ingmar Bergman online is about you, and I'm wondering where the, how that came about because I know you well. For the listeners at home, be interested to know your history with Ingmar and just as an actor. Yeah, I uh, I met him, you know, in my early twenties, and it took me in and under his arms. He saw something in me which I saw as well, <laughs> but no one else, I guess. But he saw some something special, and he. Uh, he took me under his wings and he just like, it's like being next to Picasso and paint and Picasso comes over and say, man, you got a talent. You're going to continue painting because he got something special. And the same with Ingmar. So I, I, I became more daring because I get this great confirmation and working at the national theater in Sweden, which is, you know, like any European big country has a national stage of somehow for ballet, opera, and acting. And I was on the national stage for acting where he was. So I started both acting, directing, and writing, and doing multiple things. And he just gave me a thumbs up all the time to continue. And 
to many other people at the National Theatre, they hated me because Bergman sort of gave, gave me, <laughs> he vouched for me all the time. But he, he yeah, and he he grew up more or less. His ancestors come from the same village as my mother, and he always said, "My my great my gr- great grandfather was a priest up there where your mother were, and I'm sure he spilled some seeds in the bushes, and because we had the same nose, we had the same sort of face, and I'm sure you got some DNA that belongs to my grand grandfather." <laughs> So I'm, I'm part store man, <laughs> but I, I love that man, and we we spend a lot of times together. And uh, I became adopted, more or less. I became one of his kids. He had nine others, but I became the tenth one. And uh, also, the other kids didn't like me too much because he treated me better than others. I think. But he, he, of course, as being a young artist, as I'm daring to call myself. It was great to have a guy who was double my age, just pointing at me, saying, you're on the right track. Just follow the voice within and keep on going. Listen to a lot of people, but just heed to a few. Nila like Polonia said, yeah. to the <laughs> yeah, yeah, but in a more modern language. What did, oh, go ahead. What did Polonia say? Give thy ear to many... There we are. I googled it because I'm very smart. Give every man thy ear, but very few or few thy voice. There yeah. we go. Yeah, there it is. I'm going to remember that for the next episode. Uh, yeah, say it. it it's a, natural. It's a very, very good. It actually means listen to a lot of people, but you know, just take few advice for real. You can listen to them all and smile and say you're right, but usually it's a lot of bullshit as it is in the entertainment business, which Polonies were. Well, yeah. and So to transition to something thematically similar, but totally different, I guess, in Swedish dicks. So we've talked a lot about it offline as well, but I feel like Swedish dicks is such an interesting show. And the one thing I don't know is where you actually did the research from, because it has this really interesting kind of nice guys vibe to it it has this very pulpy feel to it did you do a lot of reading did you watch it did it come from other shows at all no it all comes from my head i have i have, i don't have a big head but i have i grew up being a very you know hermit and isolated myself from society and i was living in a dream landscape my entire life i still do to some extent but I always had these ideas throughout my life, and I write them down. And and this idea about is many years ago I had this idea about a Swede being a private dick because I have a lot of friends in the stunt business and also in people that are bounty hunters and security people, and they work like private dicks. And one of my best friends told me a lot of stories, and I said, Jesus, it would be cool if a Swede were in downtown and his name was Swedish Dick. That was his name. And then he teams up with another Swedish guy, and they become the Swedish Dicks. Just a title on a billboard would cause some traffic accidents. And uh, I just came up with the idea, and I wrote, and wrote and wrote many, 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 many scripts, and I still have them in my drawer. So they're all good, but then I came down to the half-hour format because I love humor. I love dark humor. So it's, it's, it's a little bit... Swedish Dicks is Twin Peaks. This is now very Hollywood. You know, Twin Peaks meets Monty Python. There you have Swedish Dicks. Because I grew up on Monty Python, and uh, of course, they know what dark humor is. But they always had a glint in their eye. You could always laugh. And of course... Well, there was yeah. this... No, continue. When one of the Monty Python guys died, I forget which one it was, I, but it, it was... Um, Michael Chapman. It's Graham Chapman. Yeah, right, he, Graham Chapman. Yeah, when yeah. he died, and they did that HBO special. I'll never forget. And they could never do this today. I 100% believe that they get so many complaints when they just knock his urn over yeah, yeah. midway through a conversation yeah. and they spend about 10 minutes cleaning it up. <laughs> it is interesting just how it's 
So as far as the online goes and how it how it relates to all this as well, well, Swedish Dicks being a streamed show is interesting because do you think that did you have did you try and do you want it to even be a network show or do you believe it's inherently an online show as it were a streamed show? Um, I, I I had a couple of other projects and I was pitching them here in LA during a couple of years to, to networks and they're a bunch of idiots and they don't understand anything. And they, you know, you talk to somebody and say, this is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Call me on Monday, man. We're going to have a decision. You call them on Monday. They have left, they have left the network and work for somebody else. And I got tired of pitching and pitching and pitching. And I said to myself and uh, the guy I'm working with, I said to him, why the hell are we going to these dinosaurs that are dying? They're laying down fucking dying. Why don't we go to young kids who are eager to get on streaming or to web TV? Let's do it like a web TV series or, or a streaming service. And this was, you know, just after the birth of Netflix and Hulu and Amazon. So I have no interest in these networks. I'm working for one now, and they are, they are dying dinosaurs. And uh, the rules and regulations stems from the 50s, and no one understands why they can't get any talent to their shows, and they don't. And the future is like when the airplanes came, People were bitching and moaning about it, how beautiful the ships were, but you know, streaming is here. That's for the future. And and kids under fifteen, they rarely watch a TV show anymore. It is for middle aged people, maybe in mid Americana. They run home to see a show at nine o'clock on a Wednesday. And I think the future belongs to the new generation. And they, they see a movie on the telephone, and I know an older generation bitching and say, you can't see a movie, it should be seen on a big screen. And the young kid just turn around and look, you know, with stump, he's stumped or she's stumped and saying, I enjoy it on, on, my, on my phone. And if it's boring, I turn it off after six minutes. It's like with music, they listen to two, three songs, then... They don't buy a physical CD anymore. It's it, the future. We have to accept the future is here, but the human beings are always looking back. And I, I'm too curious. I'm see that I see the future, and the future that's on the path I can walk is into the future, and start to re- rejecting and bitching about iPads. It's going to blind your kids, and they're going to get diseases. They get cancer. It's been there since the beginning. When the TV came, I mean, people, I, when I was a kid, we had two channels in Sweden. We're not allowed to watch more than two hours. Otherwise, our eyes would burn before we turned 40. But my eyes are still with me, man. <laughs> it's, it's like, yeah. it's, it's, it's always this bitching and moaning from the older generation to the new. But I am blessed with a kid. She's eight years old. I mean, the skill she has on running five different computers at the same time. I could never do at the age of eight. They had different skills to yeah, I think. Yeah, and I feel like there is this weird... I feel that you are touching on something here as well about this kind of... The boomer fear of tomorrow is definitely something you're seeing, and especially in these political arguments. You're seeing these maybe very, very young boomers or very old millennials... <laughs> or just generate whatever's between the two, I forget. You're seeing them just argue the argue machine online, and now they're saying, oh, yeah, there's texting neck, and you're going to get go blind from looking at the computer too much, and you're going to – also, somehow, people who work on a computer all day are fine, by the way. Don't know how. It's bad, though, for kids. But there is this irrational fear online that there's either – especially with streaming, there's – You've got the people who are the evangelists who just think it's going to take over all TV. And there's the people who just believe it's complete trash. Nothing in the middle. And I feel that, well, that's probably going to be it. The middle the middle group are going to be the winners, the, one that's the, the ones that see the value in both. Yeah, this country is too, too big and vast. I think it's still 50 million households are on, you know, on, on tennis. 
And my, I, have, yeah. I have two neighbors here. They cut their direct TV and they have 48 free channels. And then all the watches, Hulu and Netflix and Amazon. And they get 48 channels for free on an antenna. And direct TV is bitching. You know, <laughs> and Comcast and whatever they have, they have to accept the facts that it, it's a new era, it's a new dawning, and instead of embracing it and see the potential in it, they just sit down on their asses and whine. Oh, it was so much better before, and it's the same in the record industry. But for seventy, eighty years, they've been eating. Lobster tails, drinking champagne, and just robbing artists. And now all of a sudden, they don't make trillions of mo- billions of dollars anymore. And they start bitching and accusing artists for being, you know, selfish. So I, I, I'm not an, event, an <laughs> evangelist for, for streaming and everything, but I can see it's taking over. It's, it's the only way the future is. It's, it's, it's like when cars came or the locomotive by Stevenson in, in England. You can Google it. People committed suicide because they thought he was the devil when they saw the train. The devil was coming to the village and people committed suicide. They wanted to, they wanted to drag him to court and send him to, sentence him to death or at least life in prison because he invented the locomotive. So it's just. And then you know, <laughs> I did not know that. Yeah, yeah, check it out. Yeah, because Stevenson had a tough life for inventing the greatest machine of all time, the steam engine and the locomotive. And it revolutionized the country and it revolutionized people's way of traveling and, and streaming. And, you know, it's going to revolution, revolutionize our way of looking at each other and looking at, you know, entertainment. The only problem... I can see this is a big problem for me being on movie sets all the time. It used to be a time, even when I was younger, starting as a background, as we call people who are walk-ons, they have no lines, they're in the background, in a crowded bar, you need people just in the background. When I was young, I tried to get as close to somebody working for the production or even get close to a monitor where the director was seated or just say, hi, my name is Peter. And they looked at me and get the fuck out of here. You know, but at, at, <laughs> at least I tried or to communicate with an actor. They were usually nice. Today with background, they don't even communicate with themselves. On the show I'm doing now, we have 60 every week, 60 to 70 people background. They just sit and text. And I go up to them and say, do you text each other? No. Why don't you talk to each other? Why don't you look? If you want to become a carpenter, you have to look at the carpenter, how he works. You can't get all the information from a telephone by texting on the telephone when he's showing you how to make a house. You got to look. And yeah. Learn. That, so they, they're being... That was a yeah. weird thing. It, when I, it, one thing I've seen on the few sets I've been on, nowadays it really is this weird... They're looking away from the process. And it, this is the other side of the coin, though, from it's great having this technology, but it really is. You're watching people who go to these amazing things like a film set or what have you, and they don't realize that part of the success there is actually being there, getting there and executing and actually having the ability to talk to other people. And I'm finding increasingly this is going everywhere. People will – I don't understand people who text at the table. I can understand if you have work on. But it's a weird thing where even when you make the effort to see someone and they're on their bloody phone the whole time. Yeah, and after you get it I, and after you get a text, they email you or they text you again, did you get my text? Do I have to answer immediately? Is I love to hike too, and I have something called Ronin Canyon next to me. I can walk up the hills for a couple of hours. It used to be when I started twenty two years ago, up to, you know, eight years ago. Not seven years ago, we all said good morning, you know, and hi, how are you doing? I haven't seen you for a couple of weeks. What are you up to? Blah, blah, blah. Today, 99 out of 100. I never bring my cell phone up on a hike. They're on a cell phone. They have headphones. They're out with their kids and they have headphones and they're texting. 
they're out with three dogs mm -hmm. and they're just texting. They don't want to. And that, this is early in the morning, man, when the sun rises and the birds are chirping and the whole universe is waking up, at least here. And I try to say good morning to people. And I sort of, I have my route and I always bet on myself, no one's going to say good morning this morning. And sometimes it turns out, sometimes there are people who say good morning. I think that that's a good sign, but it might be one out of 20 these days. It used to be six, seven years ago, people, you know, stopped and talk and had conversation, at least said good morning, even if you never saw, saw, had seen that pe person before. It's a nice way to say good morning when you're up on, on a big ridge, sweating your heart out. And people stopped and communicate, and now no one talks. Everybody's on the phone. And it's pretty steep. People fall and they hurt themselves, but you know, the fucking phone, they hold it up high so it won't get hurt. It's, it's, that, that's the strange thing in this. We, we, we said the internet and everything would unite the world when it came around, you know, early 90s when we started to communicate. And I was a firm believer it would make the world a much better place. And the isolation, we could communicate over borders and see that the devil doesn't live in another country. And they could see that the devil doesn't live in our country. But, but the isolation, people are isolated. We have to have restrictions, you know, written in law now. You, you're not allowed to text while you're going on a zebra crossing or you're walking where the manholes open and construction you can't you know you have you can't text them but but the but the bad thing is the isolation has become very very i mean to a point where people are locked in their little little tiny bubble themselves and yeah and you're seeing these bubbles grow with people you're seeing people these hate groups or even the people who just seek out confirmation of what they already believe so you get these even on the left and the right you get them they seek out effectively their own isolation with other people they want to isolate themselves in other in their own beliefs by finding people who agree with them and it's sad because they're, i mean what you yeah they, what are you doing yeah they're too afraid to speak out loud you know, and and then we can say the only positive thing now is with the silent majority electing a Donald Trump, or we have the Brexit in in England, and we have similar movements in in Europe. It is it has shaken up the younger audience as well, and I I see things here in the U.S. that I haven't. Seen. I've been here thirty years, and I always thought about the U.S. It's strange. It's you have picket lines and strikes, but you don't have a lot of people protesting. But the last year here, people are out in the streets. And just yesterday, people were walking out from the school for 17 minutes because of the school shooting. And that's all over the country, which was very beautiful to, to see and hear about. And I think it's a, it's a political awareness that is growing in this country which has been lost for, for a long time. So in the middle of all this isolation, there are also a, a counter movement. And I think every time the pendulum goes too far to one side, you know, there's somebody there pushing it so it will go to the other side. So in, in all the negativity we have today about, you know, fabricated media news and all the bullshit's going on about Russia invading the U.S. again, like they did in the 50s. We have this counter-revolution by young people taking, they being part of a political movement, which I, I haven't seen here. You had it in the 70s, and this is the first time since the 70s people are out protesting in the streets, which is a good thing. And then... Facebook is a good thing because then you can, or Twitter, you can actually say where you are and ask people to come and join. Yeah. And I think that there's definitely something to be said as well for 
going back to entertainment, that it allows not just the streaming, but also the communication aspects. It allows fun things to happen, kinds of comedy, kinds of entertainment that you didn't think could actually exist yeah. to grow. I was going to ask earlier, but we got onto something way more important. <laughs> but it's funny, I never think I would have seen Keanu Reeves do any kind of quasi comedy entertainment again like something like Swedish Dicks just couldn't have existed even about 10 years five years no, ago no it couldn't it couldn't and, and really something and a lot of you know talent that we have had on maybe not in the range of Keanu but close to are they are so happy because they get to do something that they don't get to do in the typical television show or in a typical movie because it's a lot of typecasting and they find it very like nourishment for the soul to do something different even if it's for three four days but it gives them a lot of joy and to do something else otherwise our entertainment business is streamlined you have to do the same thing over and over again I try to screw it up. I try to screw it up. Even if I'm European, I get to do a lot of Europeans and Eastern Europeans. But every time I try to do them a little bit different, you you can't just hit your mark and say a line and take your paycheck and walk away. I would feel embarrassed. Then I should start with carpentry. I'm a good carpenter too. So, <laughs> what do you make? I make anything. I can build a house. I can build a cabinet. I can build a table. I can. I, I love to work with wood. So, I yeah, I pick whatever. I am sitting here with an old, old, old table that I didn't do myself, but I designed myself, and it's covered with old wood that I found, driftwood. In Japan, it's just yeah, I mean, exactly. <laughs> On the subject of stuff that you wouldn't know... Unless the online existed. Uh, Nick Offerman yeah. does that as oh. well. He has like a whole wood shop he sells online. I haven't, uh, uh, yeah, 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 I haven't started selling, but I, I collect a lot of wood and I have a storage with a lot of wood and I, I don't know what to do with it. But it's great to own like a 16 inch plank from upstate New York that is eight feet long and is two inches thick and 15 inches wide. They don't do them anymore. And it's like 130 years old. I can only, I I caress it sometimes. And I think about all the people that walked upon those, those planks and get in contact with them. (laughs) That rules. Yeah. Yeah, It's, it's, I've actually got this giant redwood burl sitting behind me that I use as a table. Yeah. That's the best. Yeah, thing. The- and and it's crazy though that actually the internet allows you to get this stuff as yeah. well. I just think like it used to be you could get weird stuff from China about ten years ago, fifteen years ago with eBay, but now it's like you just buy an old boat that someone has turned into a table or something like that. And it's kind of wonderful that that people can actually do stuff like that, sell stuff like that and have some kind of business because of the internet. It's not all people just being racist on Twitter. Mm-hmm. There's actually some value to the internet. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, you can't stop creativity. And that's why what we do now, podcasts, I'm sitting in L.A., you're up there in Frisco or Oakland. I, it's, it's just incredible what we can do today. And I think creativity is the cradle of creativity. When you start getting creative, you can't stop it's and there's too many couch potatoes in this world and in this country and uh, it's like they they have to open the windows and and doors to their soul and start acting out the creativity because we're born with creativity in our souls and in our head and nothing is impossible really it might be if you're really sick and you're very very poor but still, you can do things that, I mean, we have the Paralympics now, things you weren't allowed to do for 50 years ago. They are doing now. People with one leg running 100 meters or they skating. It's just great to see. And um, I think these times are filled with a lot of gloom 
and like the you know, apocalyptic occurs, but it's I I can't cave into those kind of dark dark I, I I call them they don't have torches. I'm a torchbearer and there's a lot of people on this earth that are torchbearers. We hold the light up high and and inspire people to be creative. And if we just put that torch down, there's one more caving into darkness and negativity and slumping down on the couch looking at bad TV. So we need more torchbearers. Yeah. Torchbearers. <laughs> Reunite. That's a new party. Well, I'm wondering. That's a new, yeah. There we go. There's a new that's company. my new company or a new party. I'm going to become the president, next president of the United States. <laughs> I have to have like about. I'm just, gonna, just change the rules and become yeah, president. Yeah, I need $500 million to even start to get some votes. Ah, you can yeah, find it. Yeah. Yeah, I have to ask Oscar May. They probably yeah, got it. I have to tap into my savings. <laughs> Just a little bit. Well, it's it's interesting though because with the torchbearer and this idea of being a torchbearer, it is is there a reason you don't? And is it the anger thing that you don't? I don't mean this is a kind of a whammy question, but is there a reason you don't interact with people that much on, say, Twitter or even? Well, I don't know if you even use Facebook, but. Is there a reason you don't interact online as much? Is it because of the hatred or just how angry people get for no reason? Yeah, that's a lot of anger. That's a lot of anger, even on Twitter, that you don't answer people. They're very nasty. But also, I I was born a hermit. I was born like a loner. I call it a loner, like a village fool. I'm standing in the corner of a little town, just smiling, and I have a clenched fist and in that fist is a golden nugget that no one else can see but it makes me happy to know I have that golden nugget whether you can see it or not but I, I've always been a loner I don't like to mingle with other people and I don't know why if that's a talent or a curse but I never go you know to red carpet or dinners or rap parties and all that crap i can't stand it because it makes me nervous i get diarrhea and i get in a bad mood and i don't get to sleep i need to go to bed nine o'clock and step up at five o'clock in the morning then i feel happy so i am yeah i am a loner i'm very grateful that i've worked in this call it industry for 30 years soon and i I've never been to these parties or I've done some red carpets when it's really in my contract to do a red carpet. But if I can avoid it, I do. Because my goal is not to be in tabloids or have my photo plastered, you know, in some glossy magazine. I want to work as an actor, director, writer, producer, come up with crazy ideas and play my music, write my poems. I don't have to show the poems for anybody, but I like to do them for myself. But honestly, I am a loner. I, I don't want to be with other people. It's like you and I had dinner. We were three people. That's enough for me. If we're four or five, then I, I, I don't know how to behave. Either I would order a you know, either I drink just water and go home fast and I come up with white light mm -hmm. or I drink or I drink two <laughs> bottles of wine myself and become, you know, depressed. <laughs> it's it's I am I'm not an anti social, you know, but I, I I am a loner. I like to be alone. I I like to sit in my little studio in my garage which is a beautiful studio and create music to sit four or five hours or to write i i can't be in rooms where there's a lot of people maybe it's also because of my my profession where you you're together with actors and actresses my whole life more or less and everything is there's a lot of screaming and bitching about, you know, the shoes. There's something wrong with the shoes, and this dress look makes me look fat, while the, while the, the earth is, you know, 
pivoting and there's wars going on and I think that's so trivial. I don't want to be part of this garbage. I try then I walk away and I come when they say the cameras are ready. It's hmm. it's so yeah. you consider the online almost a reflection of your your offline, which is very different yeah. very, very different to everyone else. Yeah, I, I yeah, I call it a hermit. And I think that's why I, the only one in, in Hollywood that I sometimes can have a beer with or sit and talk with is actually Keanu. And he calls himself a hermit too. He's maybe because deep inside I'm shy, even if no one thinks so. And even Keanu right. is very, very shy. They've been like screaming at him because he's strange at the red carpet. He looks down, he's trying to put up an attitude by looking cool. And I, I know him. He's he's just very shy. He's shaking. It's it's a part of the business that some people can't handle really without getting sick, more or less. Physically sick. Not mentally, but physically sick. And afterwards, you, you don't enjoy, even if someone comes up and says, that was fantastic. You think everybody's lying and you just want to go home. You just want to go home and continue working because that's, that's the saddest, what should I say, the satisfaction of this job to be creative all the time if you're lucky to work all the time. It's like your body growing older and older and older, but your brain is still 16 years and I'm curious as hell what's going to be next. What's going to happen next? What What's my next gig? What, what am I doing next? And I have, right. because I always had a motto of number one, I want to be a happy human being. Number two, it's like hopefully to work with TV and drama or you know, acting, directing. But the most important thing for me is to be a human being and to act accordingly, to be nice to people, to say good morning, you know, address people. And that's always been the most important thing for me. And I'm telling you now in the podcast, if God came down, that I call God, that no one else know, knows how, how my God looks like. But if God came down today and said, you will not do any more acting or any more producing or anything, you will, I would clap my hands and jump for joy and say, what are we going to do, God? What are we going to do? That's awesome. Something new. And maybe God said, well, you're going to die. And I'm going to say, tell them I died as a happy person, God. That's always been my motto. Yeah, I always wondered deep down if I would be happier if I could disconnect more. And I do wonder if all these people who are super angry all the time in person have this issue where they just, well, I know I, I have it to some extent where it's they're just angry because of the constant feed of different people's opinions, kind of the, the obtuse version of that Palladius quote, just way too many voices at that point. Yeah. It's just an overload of not so much information, but just st stuff. It transcends being useful. Yeah, I don't know if I would survive in, in doing the job you're doing because I would maybe have a baseball bat next to me and, and hurt some people and end up in, <laughs> in an asylum. or I, I don't know, but I think... We have a similar thing sometimes when you come to a threshold, when it's, you know, a production, a movie, or even TV, you, sometimes you hit a wall and no one knows what to do and people start screaming and bitching. And I, I tend to walk away or I just open up my sluice, I call it my brain, where all the words goes in in my right ear and they just disappear in my left ear. They go out. I don't, I do what I call highlight and delete. I look at them and I say, everything you say, everything <laughs> you're saying now is on high, is highlighting in my brain. And when this is over, I'm just going to press delete. And that <laughs> gives, you know, I smile 
Or if it's too intense, I have actually the ability, which you might not have, I can just walk away. I walk away and I walk into a corner and I ask Ingmar, what the hell would you have done in this situation? And you, he usually answers from up above or deep down below somewhere. But I usually get an answer. But in, in this industry and in your, your profession, there's a lot of people with insecurity and everybody's sitting with a mortgage and they have mistresses and lovers. They have cars they want to buy. They, you know, they want to have the bling bling and become rich. They want to become famous. And they have all these issues and no one is really, really strong enough to take a decision themselves. No one dares to take a decision because if I take this decision, it might cost me my job. And then I say, okay, hmm. it will cost you your job, but at least you were fucking honest to yourself and to the people around you. There's always other jobs to do. If you can't continue in this profession, there's tons of Open up, become a florist <laughs> or something. There's something my father taught me being young and doing the transit over to the U.S., a country he loved and he worshipped. And I, you know, I have the same TNT in my blood as my father. And he always said to me, what's the worst thing that can happen to you? I said that I'll die. You're going to die anyway, son. So fuck that. Uh, uh, I, I can lose my apartment. Well, if you lose your apartment, you're going to find somewhere to sleep, I'm sure. What if I'm going to sleep in the streets? Well, try to enjoy it as long as you can. Avoid drugs, avoid drinking. That's a good way. And I said, but if I have no money at all, he said, you have two good hands. You, you have a thumb and you have four fingers on, on each hand? Yeah. Use them. Use them. Hmm. And then, you know, all the fear fell off of me at a young age. And I said, what the hell am I afraid of? To lose a job? To lose an apartment? To go bankrupt? No, I don't care. I would survive one way or another because I have my two hands. As well. <laughs> and how did that lead? How did you actually get to America? I've never actually found that out. Uh, I say, as John Lennon and I, I, we made a left at Greenland, <laughs> and all of a sudden we were in, in the U.S. <laughs> no, we were, you know, we were always on our verge to immigrate uh, over here, and my father was working a lot here, a lot of relatives over here, <laughs> but I, I didn't make the transition over until. I knew I could make the transition over. And that was pretty late in my life, late 20s, early 30s, because I worked at the national stage, as you have in England, you know, you have your national stage. And it's very prestigious to have a good contract and you're on a monthly salary. You can direct, you can act, you, can, you learn a lot just by looking at the super, super professional older ones. And you talk to them, you go out with them, you have a beer with them. And I spent 10 years just learning, learning, and being with Ingmar and learning, learning, learning. And then I got to tour a lot with Bergman's performances all over the world. I got offers from U.S., offers from other directors in England to come and work. And one day I said, you know, now it's time to move. And that's like 30 years ago. 30 years plus. My first gig here, I think, was 86, and I got an agent and stuff. I still had something to do in Sweden at the National Theater with my contract. But I consider 86 being the year when I sort of took this step over here. And, and it's, it is, <clears throat> and it's been in my body since I was five years old. I told my parents that I would live here in California. When I, when I get older and probably work with music or acting because are you still playing uh, music? Yeah. I, I don't know if you ever play. Is that the next thing? Yeah, I'm just now producing a really great Swedish girl actually. And we, she was just over singing 
putting down her lead lead voice on six, 16 tracks and now we're sitting producing putting everything together now we're editing sort of the movie we shot the whole movie and now the editing process putting together the album so that is my sidekick it's it's cheaper than going to a shrink and uh, you yeah it's it's soul food it's it is a divine thing to do to work with music and have the ability to sit in the studio for a couple of days and work with talented people it just gives you joy i just called my the producer i'm working with the other day and i said we have to do this more often every time i leave you i'm in a happy mood i play some of the songs in my car i come home i'm smiling i'm you know, sometimes when you come home from a movie set, you're kind of so tired and stressed out that I never get in a foul mood or bad mood, really. But, but working with the music always makes me happy. And I'm glad it, it came into my life at an early age. And uh, I, still, I still can enjoy listening to the big revelation I had when I got the Beatles white album it was the first album I could buy me and my brother saved money for many months and we're still debating who owns who because that's a double album so we collected the money and just to listen from track one to track 22 just blew my mind and still when I listen to it it's like fantastic it's breathtaking what those kids did in a couple of years but it's music is for and it goes hand in hand with with actors they are ridiculed sometimes because they play music and they try to perform and they do but it is if, if you have some talent as an as a actor you know and you have to know how to sing and dance a little bit because it's part of your profession because if someone asked me today to be in a musical i can't say no i can't sing of course i would try my best to be in a musical and to do my best even if they said no nah, you might not be good enough to be in the musical but you have a musical ear. I'm sure you, you dabble with theater. I know you have a lot of love for music. I, th I think it comes yeah. hand in hand. So something. Yeah, and I feel that, I feel your whole attitude is just more positive than most people in entertainment this, these days. It seems that there is this weird, in music, in in music and entertainment, I guess, all over the place, it's all just so dark. and It's not even the kind of thoughtful darkness no, I, I, I used to see in entertainment where it was like very thoughtful and organized and careful. It was just now it's just drum fizzy. Yeah, I hate Donald Trump and that's yeah. why I'm depressed. It wasn't there when Reagan was in or Nixon yeah. or in England, John Major, <laughs> Margaret Thatcher. They were, they were not as depressed then somehow. No, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. I mean, Ronald Reagan today is supposed to be the, one of the best presidents we ever had. And if you go to history, what, yeah, and all of, all of our stones, uh, I recommend it on Netflix, where he his My American History that he did for his kids. And Ronald Reagan, I mean, he nearly bankrupt this country. And... and and it's yeah. um, today because there's an old saying in, in, in the country where I grew up, when, when the devil becomes an old man, they treat him like a priest <laughs> with reverence. <laughs> it's, yeah. And it's the same here. And of course, people can be angry at Donald Trump, but they take it as an excuse. I, I, I tell my liberal friends, well, Sometimes the silent majority, you live in a country where people can vote. And, you know, two and a half years from now, you can vote again and you can vote him out. But 47% of the registered Democrats never voted because they thought it was a slam dunk. They never, they never got out of the couch. And I said, 
because they calling them even Hillary Hillary Clinton called them like trailer trash, knuckle draggers, you know, homophobic yeah. idiots that can't. But they're smart enough to go to to cast the vote and fill in those stupid ballots they have here that are impossible to encrypt. But at least they got there and got the names right. And you had this similar thing yeah. in, in England with Brexit, where everybody was laughing and slapping their knees, you know, and a, a aristocracy was laughing and slapping their knees and, you know, this will never happen. Then they woke up like, and now I'm sure they're going to have a second referendum where, where the Brexit will never happen. So it's, uh, I think the entertainment, I'm happy. I try to be a torchbearer and there is a lot of gloom, but as I said before, when, when the pendulum, that's why you have Grand Canyon in the USA. It doesn't exist anywhere else because the pendulum has a big swing here. It's large, it's huge. But when it's on the gloomy, gloomy, gloomy side, there's going to be a couple of us just taking the pendulum and swing it back into the light. And that's how it goes. The more garbage there is on TV, the more great things going to be done online, in streaming, independent movies, people putting up their own credit cards and a little house or whatever to do a movie for $600,000 or three billboards, you know, just to make something, a small little movie. And all of a sudden, it's, yeah. wow, people saw it and it changed people's lives and we still have that ability. But in the, in the big scam, yeah. I think that's, Man, I'm talking a lot. <laughs> I think that that's, no, no, it's good. I was going to say, that's actually a lovely point to wrap it up because I think that we've, we've <laughs> kind of got to, we've gone in a different direction than I expected. Yeah, yeah. Where yeah, yeah, it's about positive. To shut up sometimes, you're the director. Yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely not. But that is that is it from us. Thank you for uh, coming on, Peter. Really yeah, appreciate you. your time. I miss you. It was wonderful. But keep up the torch and remember to highlight and delete when they start bitching in that room. Just smile and let it go in through your right ear and out your left. And you can you can play it on high speed too. It sounds even funnier. <laughs>